Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Annabelle from Lark Industries. We really appreciate you joining us today for youth spaces, more than skate parks and BMX tracks. There'll be an opportunity at the end of the session to talk to Luke and Spidey, uh, who can answer any questions you may have, and you can put these down during the event using the Q&A button below. I'll now pass you over to Luke Seaborn. Hello, Luke. Thank you, Annabelle. Hello and welcome to all. And thanks for tuning into the presentation on Youth Spaces. Today, we will review the approach, past, present and future, review some statistics on youth, look at how technologies enhance play and contribute to more interactive designs, explore case studies of successful youth precincts, look at some permanent and relocatable options, and hear from Virtue Pilar on parkour. A good starting point is to understand what the term youth actually encompasses. The Oxford Dictionary defines it as the time of life when a person is young, especially the time before a child becomes an adult. Given the fast paced changing world we live in, the wants, needs and must haves are constantly evolving for our youth. I believe there'd be a high percentage of parents with teenagers tuning into this webinar who often hear statements from them such as, I'm bored, I have nothing to do, what can I do? The reality is playgrounds traditionally cater well for toddlers and smaller children. However, most fail to accommodate the youth adequately. The unfortunate truth is the attention spans are shortening, so capturing and maintaining engagement with the youth is certainly challenging. Who can forget one of the most iconic movies in Australian history in the 1980s that starred one of our national treasures, Nicole Kidman. Being an impressionable teenager myself growing up in this era, I have fond memories of begging my parents for a BMX bike, waking up early on Saturday mornings and meeting my friends and riding in places to emulate our idols such as this one. If you weren't a BMXer, then maybe you're a skateboarder or even both. Kids from around the country embraced the sports emphatically and the focus quickly shifted towards councils to provide challenging and safe amenity for the youth to meet, play and indulge in their chosen sports. The next few slides are courtesy of UNICEF's Office of Research and I think it's important that before designing any space, we first understand the target age group along with the, what trends, influences and developmental stage we're dealing with. UNICEF's research shares a fantastic insight into the workings of the adolescent brain. This research was gathered from eight leading brain researchers and compiled in 2018. To quote the summary that accompanied the research, with 1.2 billion adolescents under its global mandate, it is crucial for UNICEF to identify the right periods or windows of opportunity for cost-effective scalable interventions to improve adolescent wellbeing. Over the past decade, a growing body of scientific knowledge has improved understanding and how experience and environment can combine with genetics to shape the adolescent brain. Advances in neuroscience reveal that the adolescent brain is still a work in progress offering a crucial second window of opportunity to influence the development of children in their second decade of life. Now, if we refer to the research, the uh, windows of opportunity are graphed at the bottom here. The second window of opportunity in a child's development, the area in particular we're focusing on today, uh, it's defined as a period of vulnerability and opportunity. Puberty initiates learning and brain development, which lead to structural remodeling and, new, and neural reconfiguration of brain systems. Increased sensation seeking, motivation for relations and sensitivity to social evaluation. Adolescent brains are sensitive to stresses such as biological, so changes in hormone levels. Uh, population changes, exposure to wars and disaster can all have lasting impacts and social changes, changes in social environments. So they're developing identities and connecting with peers. This graph compares the positive versus negative spirals that typical adolescents can experience. Some negative impacts and problematic behavior patterns of behavior noted in the downward spiral here. However, through support from adults and positive activities such as sport and exercise, we're aiming to keep the spiral in the upward direction to build strong, resilient individuals as they transition into adulthood. So let's take a look at public amenity past. Traditional thinking 
and response to cater for sports in our parks and open spaces in the past has generally been addressed by provision of a skate ramp, bowl or BMX track, which has served the purpose well. Councils and asset owners have continually committed to investing in upgrading open spaces to cater for the masses. However, like most industries, and with the introduction of the internet in the 1990s, a new platform was born in which to share interests and ideas on a global scale. Though sports like BMX and skateboarding are still popular, websites such as YouTube now quickly and effortlessly share videos of new emerging sports and interests that encourage and entice the youth. This has resulted in us having to challenge our traditional thinking and explore new ways to not only add value to existing spaces, but also apply this new thinking to design engaging spaces for the future. We started by giving these spaces a more reflective name, like youth act activation hubs. We've broadened our minds and embraced new ideas regarding activities that our youth are interested in, seeking their input and approaching them on a more collaborative effort. Without doubt, one of the most significant changes influencing the youth today is technology. It's rapidly evolving and advancing, and as many parents will attest to, getting children to put down their devices, get outside and get active is a daily battle. According to Australian statistics, one in four or 25% of our youth is overweight or obese. A further alarming fact is that this statistic becomes two in three or 67% of those youth transition this way into adulthood. So the second window of opportunity as UNICEF frame it is vitally important. As we've touched upon already, the new thinking surrounding youth zones generally revolves around multi-activity. However, to date, largely focused on multiples of static equipment. Just like the development of the indoor gaming console, technology too is playing a vital role in the development of equipment for the outdoors with particular attention aimed towards the youth. Stimulating an interactive equipment that has the power to draw the youth to a space, engage them and provide meaningful amenity for them to meet and socially interact with one another. By creating challenges and games that continually upgraded and offer the ability to play against other users all over the world is hugely powerful. Very clear that using their language of technology is what we're doing to emphasis and get the youth moving. A youth activity hub could look a little like this one where it combines a beautiful static and interactive equipment along with running tracks and loads of room to accommodate non-structured play and exercise. Although this image does not strictly depict youth uh, exclusive hub, I believe it goes a long way in proving that through clever util utilization of products, you can deliver a multi-generational space quite successfully. Here's another example of design concept that was submitted for a modern youth hub project where, which incorporates a similar design philosophy. There is four distinct zones that cater for soccer, hockey, large and small field, handball and memory games through interactive units. Along with parkour, calisthenics or street workout, basketball, static, large and small field, hockey and soccer. That's over 10 disciplines structured and numerous unstructured sports able to accommodate all in one space. Again, not only youth targeted, but quite easily multi-generational. A simple table tennis table can be such a valuable inclusion for a youth zone. A sturdy and robust table will have the ability to accommodate not only table tennis, but also unprescribed play games, such as you see in this image here, negating the need for the owner to provide equipment for its use. Muggers or multi-sport arenas have been a natural progression in product design. The ability to accommodate sports such as soccer, basketball, volleyball, hockey, all in a smaller consolidated footprint can be very attractive. There's not only fully surrounded arenas to consider, partially closed or fence one end designs provide a great backstop to prevent any stray balls bouncing away and also effectively define the perimeter of a space. Outdoor gyms are no new concept. The world famous Muscle Beach in California was established in the 1950s and attracted gym users from all over the world. Solidifying the human desire to exercise in the outdoors is certainly very attractive. We're fortunate to have one of the most magnificent climates in the world. So exercise coupled with great weather go a long way in building a positive mental and physical mindset. The challenge has always been and will continue to be offering equipment that best provides you a complete workout in an outdoor environment that closely mimics what you can get from an indoor gym. Let's face it, who likes paying gym fees? 
well-designed exercise park can deliver challenging opportunities with equipment such as plated weights, medicine ball throws, battling ropes, etc., all providing you a diverse and engaging workout. Calisthenics or street workout, as we saw earlier, is one of the concepts is certainly very popular with the youth, and in particular designs and layouts that encourage all ability use. These units have very few if any moving parts, which means very little to maintain throughout its working life. Skate, scooter or BMX, relocatable elements incorporated into a design layer may add benefit as they can provide a short term activation if required or the perfect permanent addition to an existing outgrown facility. Being relocatable, and if you find it's not being utilized as planned in a certain location, then relocation to another site is certainly a relatively inexpensive option. Unfortunately, this is an all too common occurrence we see when we design spaces. They're designed to deter rather than promote. Could the solution lie in, prov in providing the youth an amenity in a less than traditional locations, such as this installation in France? By still maintaining a level of vehicular access, limited disruption to pedestrians, however, promoting youth activities rather than deterring them. I believe this project goes a long way in confirming that youth hubs are not just for parks and send a positive message that it is possible to integrate rather than segregate. A well catered for youth hub should give good consideration to relaxation zones if and wherever possible, as, youth, as not all youth are into high energy activities. A standard commercial hammock or custom lane net solution tailored to the site can be the perfect relaxation or chill zone. Opportunities to integrate artwork or street art can provide outstanding results and a perfect canvas for a wider youth group engagement and contribution. As we touched upon earlier in the presentation, YouTube is just one website. The youth create, share and embrace ideas. So we're fortunate to have such a valuable tool at our fingertips to gain fast insights into our audience. A quick search under the topic parkour turns up a huge array of videos with view counts in the millions. So now to share with us a little more about the past, present and future of the sport, I'd now like to pass you over to Fetu Pilea, or better known in the parkour circles as Spidey. Spidey. Thank you, Luke. Uh, and greetings from Finland. Here it's actually summer and, and the morning. We have uh, nice weather and it's almost 20 degrees in Celsius, which is very, very hot for Finland. Uh, maybe not for you, but for, for Finland. And what I'm, why I'm here is I'm here to tell you about, about parkour a bit. So what is parkour and, and why parkour? That's the question of the day. If you guys have any questions, please write them in the, in the Q&A box. We'll answer them after this presentation with Luke. I believe we have some time for questions. Just, I, I believe many of you have heard about parkour or free running, but to get you in the, in the same, base, uh, same page, let's go through the basics. So parkour actually originates from France. It started about 20 years ago there with a group of young men who called themselves the Yamakasi. It, in 2003, it quickly spread out from France with, with the media coverage and and has been here ever since but the good question is that what do you actually do when you do parkour when you practice parkour i think the french people have a nice way to put it they say that you run climb and jump and that's that's it but what what i've done here is i've divided parkour moves in the six different sections so to, to give you more insight to it so we have, for example, vaults here, where we go over something about waist high. That's a very typical parkour technique. We have a lot of balancing techniques with one limb, two limbs, or three limbs, standing on some narrow things and, and so on. There are also many moves when we go through something. And here you go, here you can see a guy going through two rails, those we call underbars. And we don't only jump with, with our legs, but we also use our upper body and hands where we create this kind of hanging and swinging movements. A bit same kind of movements that you can find in street workout or calisthenics. 
And there are, also, of course, a lot of different kind of jumps. Here you can see a typical jump from rail to another. Those we call precision jumps. And we have a lot of different kind of wall techniques using how we use the walls or uh, to, to create movement. Here you can see a wall run, which the, the tracer or the parkour practitioner uses his one leg to get high on the wall. Um, parkour has many names. Free running is, is very common. It originally was called art de placement, which means art of displacement in, in French. And basically all these names mean about the same thing. They used to at least mean the same thing. Um, so an important question for maybe for you is, is who can do parkour? There are no competitions in parkour. You can do it at your own level. And hence the answer is that anybody can do parkour. And where can you do it? Is somewhere or anywhere you find these kind of obstacles where you can do these different kind of techniques. So briefly, why am I here to tell you about this? Who am I? Um, myself, I started parkour 203. I did travel a lot around, the, around the Europe to meet other parkour people. To, to, to learn about it because we were the only ones in Finland back in the day. Uh, I was the first parkour professional in Finland, that was 2007. And I've been the CEO of, of the Finnish Parkour Academy ever since. What I do as my job is, uh, is that I coach people, I teach parkour, uh, I do some performing stuff, yeah, shows. And I also do a lot of managing, which means I, I help other parkour people to do their job. I also design parkour equipment and areas. We've, we've built ourselves uh, eight gyms to Finland. So we, we coach in eight different gyms around Finland. We also designed um, parkour equipment with, with a lab set. At the moment, the Parkour Academy of Finland uh, we have about 3,000 students weekly. We do different kind of shows and workshops, and we also design the parkour equipment and areas. And these numbers conclude that at the moment, we are the world's largest parkour teaching establishment. So, hence I'm here. Um, so now you basically know about what is parkour and who am I. So those are nice stories, but maybe you can ask at this point, but that, so what? Why parkour? I think parkour has potential. And to have potential, you need two things. You need people to have interest about it, and you need people to have access to it. So are people interested in parkour? I will show you two examples. My favorite trend meter is, is the YouTube. So if we go to YouTube and take uh, top 20 videos in certain topics and see their view count, parkour is number one. If you take, for example, trampoline, BMX and, and skateboarding, it has the most view count in the top 20 videos. But this is a seminar about youth. So are the young people interested in parkour? Well, in Finland, there was a survey. There has been many exactly. And they asked over 100,000 children in over 1,000 schools that what would you like to do when it comes to sport and cultural activities? And parkour was number one. You can see here that with the people from 7 to 12 years old, parkour was clearly, clearly number one what they would like to do in schools. And with the 13 to 15 years old, the photographing was a bit more popular than parkour, but parkour is second. Maybe the photographing is because of selfies, but luckily you can combine these two, right? So now we know that, yes, people are interested in parkour. Do they have access to it? Yes, they do, because basically you can do parkour anywhere. So parkour has potential, right? But then it's a good question that, okay, it has, it has potential, but but is it any good for you? 
And even though this research was done, done in Finland, I believe that, you know, the sensation of urge to climb a tree when you see one, it's not our national trait. It's a global phenomenon. So I think the results of this research, this survey, they apply to many other countries also. But is parkour any good for you? Well, according to research, it is. So it, if you think of the benefits, parkour challenges you physically in many ways. So it also develops you in many ways. It also has mental and social benefits. And why is that? Well, the mental benefits, when doing parkour, you face fear, you face risks, you face your own limitations, you solve problems in a creative way. So I think it's not only physical exercise, but it's also very good brain exercise, hence the mental benefits. And the social benefits, why the social benefits is that even though parkour is an individual sport or individual discipline, you almost always do it in a group. And in the group, you don't actually compete with each other, but you help each other out, you contribute. So hence the social benefits. So now we know that parkour has potential and it actually is good for you, right? At this point, I many times get the question, but yes, yes, but is parkour safe? Why this question is, if you go to a YouTube and you look what kind of videos have the most view counts, are those parkour videos that they actually look quite, quite dangerous. There are people jumping from rooftop to another. And those kind of videos spread out, they get the view counts. Hence, the image of parkour is actually a bit different than what you actually do in parkour. But anyway, we've done research about is parkour dangerous. We did a survey, big survey in Finland. We got over 400 answers from parkour practitioners. And we asked them that what kind of injuries have you had with the last year? And from that survey, we could derive a number that what's the average, uh, how many injuries in average you get when you train thousands of thousand hours of parkour. And this, uh, this kind of survey has been done in many other sports also. And we can compare now to get some understanding. From this, this research, we learned that parkour is about as dangerous as running and tennis. For example, soccer is much more dangerous than parkour. As you can see here in parkour, you get about four injuries in 1,000 hours of training. In soccer, that's almost double. And in soccer, the injuries are more severe. By this, I mean that the injuries keep you from training quite a bit longer than the injuries in average in parkour, which are bruises and cuts. So, and in my mind, when you think of risks, you have to also talk about the benefits. So you sort of, in your head, you create a benefit risk ratio. And in this parkour really excels because we know how good parkour is actually for you. So at this point, we know that parkour has potential, right? It's actually good for you. It's actually much more safe than you would think. So it's actually very safe. But then we can think that what can we do to get people trying out parkour? Why should you build parkour areas? Because basically you can train parkour anywhere, right? It's a good question. And this is how as a parkour professional, I see it. When I train parkour in a, in a city, I might find one good place to train wall runs here and maybe a good place to train the hanging and swinging stuff is two kilometers the other way. And maybe a nice place to do some balance training is 500 meters from there. So when we build the parkour area, we can bring all the basic functions of parkour in one place. And we can make it even so that it's good for beginners, it's, more, it's good for advanced, so there is scalability. You also get the social benefits because it serves as a meeting place. So you will find people training parkour there. There will be beginners, there will be more advanced. They can mingle together, they can share tips. That will create the community, community around parkour. 
And built parkour areas, of course, they are more safe. The risks there are obvious, and uh, the equipment won't break. And there, of course, what is most important is that the area is designed according to the target group, for the target group, because parkour area for eight-year-old kids is very much different than parkour area for, for adults. We also design the parkour areas according to the safety standards. So we can design the parkour area according to the play safety standards, which is about the same in Australia as, in, as, is, as it is in Europe. And in Europe, there is also a safety standard for parkour, which can be also used in Australia. While there is none in Australia, you can use the European one. But it really doesn't come from the safety standards, the safety, but understanding the target group and deciding the area for them. And what I think is, is most important with the built parkour areas, if they are well designed, they really inspire. You feel that I really want to go there and I really want to move. So a few tips about what is a well-designed parkour area? How can you recognize that? Well, first of all, it has to be designed by professionals who have much experience in teaching parkour. When you have been teaching different, different age groups, you really understand what they can do and what they inspire from. So it needs to be designed by professionals. There needs to be variety in the equipment. This comes actually from little details. As you can see from the picture, for example, here is a small rail. And because of that rail, this equipment has much more functions. And for example, with these two equipment, there's actually a bar connecting them. And hence, you can also swing from this bar. You could land, for example, on this equipment from the swing. But because this has more details, this has ground markings here. You can first land on the ground marking and then start to train your swinging here. Uh, and also, one little detail you can find here is the inclined walls. As you see, these are not straight, but inclined. And you can find different angles, which is a very good detail for practicing wall runs. And in all in all, it's not about the single equipment, but very much about how they are placed regarding each other. And this really needs somebody who understands how you combine the moves to make it perfect. Here's a nice example, actually from primary school in the northern, northern territory of Australia, which I like a lot. There are lots of low equipment shots such as this one that the kids from primary school can really use. The hanging equipment, this is quite low. This is about 160 centimeters. So the talk, target audience has really given some consideration when building this area. That's all I have to say for now. So, Luke, let's go back to you. And at the end, we'll go through the questions you have put in the Q&A box. Feel free to send some more if you like. Luke, you have muted yourself. I can't hear you yet. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you, Perchu. Uh, we'll close by looking at uh, one final case study. Here's a great example of a project in Victoria completed in 2018, which is part of the 1.6 billion Caulfield to Dandenong level crossing removal project. In total, 11 activation nodes of fitness and exercise equipment were strategically placed along the 17 kilometres of pedestrian and cycle paths that make up the project. The simplicity of the nodes has been successful due to the specific selection of equipment to cater for the target audience. I note parkour, bouldering, gym, crossfit, table tennis zones, all with clever utilization of markings and jump targets incorporated in the softball rubber that all combine seamlessly to offer a diverse and exciting space. So on behalf of Spidey and I, I'd like to uh, thank you for your time today and hope we've provided some challenging ideas and perspectives and more importantly, stimulate a broader discussion. Always remember to play up and work out. Annabelle. Thanks, Luke and Spidey. Um, we have some questions. We have quite a lot of questions. Um, so I'll just search through. We have, we have some time for a few. 
Um, Spidey, this is for you. And it, it's sort of uh, from two people. One's Jamie and uh, Fiona. And together their questions are, uh, can the elderly do parkour? And are girls and young women into parkour? So it's two questions, but really combined together. Yeah, yeah. first the elderly people. Because parkour, there's, there, there isn't anything you have to absolutely do. If you do pole vaulting, there is something you have to do. <laughs> but, but if you do parkour, you can do it in your own level. So anybody can do it, also the elderly people. In the Parkour Academy of Finland, we actually had a group, uh, a course called Adults Really, which were adults 50 plus parkour for them, and it was a huge success. So yes, only problem is, is the image of parkour, which comes from the extreme videos from YouTube. So it might, the image might scare people off, but we need to change that. So yes, they can do parkour. And girls are, are girls and women in the parkour, Yes, actually they are. You can find much more girls and women in parkour than, for example, in skateboarding. Uh, there's another question actually from Venus, again, um, for you, Spidey, with regards to designing parkour equipment uh, for older adults. Um, she's wondering if there is any existing older adult parkour facilities in Europe or European countries. Um, I think in... <sighs> point of the parkour area is that if it's well designed it's very very scalable so even the kids or even the adults or even the elderly people can do parkour there it just needs to uh, because if, if the equipment they have if they have variety enough so you can find various levels of moves in one equipment and in one area so yes basically in, if the area is well designed anybody can train there Fantastic. Here's, here's one for you, Luke, from Catherine. Um, I'm wondering about the gender differences in the youth spaces designed. Um, do you find uh, the girls participate equally in skate, parkour, ball games, etc., as much as boys? Good question. Um, I don't have any uh, answers to that one right at my fingertips, but uh, more than happy to, uh, to follow that up and respond accordingly. Fantastic. Um, I'm just having a look through. Is there anything you would like to wrap up with, Spidey or, or Luke? Just see if we've got something else come through that we can answer. Otherwise, I think we might um, call it a day. If we have any, oh, here's one. Um, is parkour strictly an urban, Richard's asked, is parkour strictly an urban activity? Or have you seen examples of parkour in natural areas? Good question. Yes, that's a good question. and. And now I ask you, there's actually homework for you, you there. So when you walk out now from your office and or for your, from your home, look around the area and, and see if you can, could find some proper, some good level challenges for yourself. For example, balancing somewhere or making a little jump. Then you begin to understand how parkour people think. They actually forget what the structure was originally made for and they think what they can do with it. So. For them, it really doesn't matter if it's a wall, wall or if it's a tree. They just think, hmm, what can I do with it? Uh, is it, you know, stable enough that I can hang from it so it doesn't break? That this kind of problem solving and responsible thinking is, is, is typical for parkour. But so, yes, you can find parkour anywhere, basically, in nature, in, in the cities also. Um, one last question, I think. Uh, thanks, everybody. Uh, Catherine has asked, do you feel there needs to be, and this is local, Spidey, to be a training facility for parkour to justify its installation? Um, do, do you feel that people uh, need to be trained and know what to do with the parkour circuit if there's no training? Uh, I think you've just already said it's intuitive, but, um, uh, yeah, does there need to be proper on-site training? Yeah. Uh, to, to answer you this, if... Um, no, it doesn't have to be, they don't have to go through a like basic course of parkour before going to a public area. Uh, if we design a parkour area for a parkour gym where there's actually coaches, the design will end up being very much different than what we design to public areas where there might be people training with, for the first time. So it needs to take, you need to take this account in the design, if it's public area or, or closed area where there's always coaches. So 
that's that's yes. the point. Of course, it needs to be decided with professionals and and maybe put an info sign there, uh, which has a link to to tutorial videos, how to start the training, how to how to do warm up and so on. Hmm. Well, uh, Lynn has asked actually, is it and, and it'll flow on from that. Is it best to activate a new park or facility with an instructor? Uh, yes, we have. Yeah, when we we've, we've been, I've been in many events that when there's parkour area built, there's like opening ceremonies, and there are some professional parkour coaches that will teach the local people, and then they get inspired from that, and that that will you know uh, make the usage of the parkour area go go higher right from the beginning. And they will, you know, people who attended there will stay there. They will inspire more people and so on. So it's like avalanche effect. So <laughs> that's a good idea. That's a good idea to have parkour professionals there for their opening ceremonies. Oh, okay. Um, so Hannah wants to know, can parkour spaces coexist with traditional play spaces? Uh, does it work to add parkour elements to play? Mm, good I, question. I like, yeah, I, I like that idea a lot. Uh, because we've also also designed parkour for very little kids, where they actually train parkours are like more like basic motor skills. But in the standard, the safety standard of parkour, it says that they need to be separated. It doesn't say how, but you need to have clear idea that okay, this is something else and this is play. So we go with that naturally, and if that's if it's there like. Uh, parkour training designed for adults, I would separate play and the parkour area. If it's parkour training area designed for kids, I, I see no reason to separate them. Okay, one more from Lena. This is one more. We're getting so many questions. We'll respond to all the ones we haven't answered um, via uh, email directly. Uh, but the last one is, are rope climbs, Luke? included in parkour activities maybe you right climbs. Hmm. or the spotty or together yeah I, I i would like to answer that because um there's there have been a lot of parkour e equipment that have done have been made out of ropes and they claim to be parkour equipment but the equipment made out of ropes are actually rubbish when it comes to training parkour in parkour as you saw the movements that i introduced there weren't any actually with the ropes. So I would, if I wanted to build a good parkour area, I would totally avoid any equipment with ropes. Okay, I said we were going to finish, but I've got another really good question. Yes, good, should, <laughs> um, should. <laughs> Elise works in research of youth spaces and um, uh, there are gender differences in the importance of park or park features for encouraging physical activities. Uh, the evidence shows that males tend to place a greater value on parkour of obstacle infrastructure. Uh, seeing as these structures have been shown to be less appealing among adolescent females, how can these spaces be designed to cater for boys and girls' interests alike? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I think I covered I in, in so. my presentation. Yeah, definitely. I covered in my presentation about um, chill-out zones, I think a, a multi-generational and and um, not gender specific. So uh, I think that's important, um, definitely in inclusion and consideration into, into youth zones. What I've seen in Finland, I, for example, last week I was in a parkour area that has been built and designed by us, is there was a lot of teenagers there and there were boys and girls. And when the boys did, did, did their thing, the girls also were inspired by them and tried it out. So, but I, I'm, I'm with Luke here, for example, if you make a youth hub, I like the idea a lot. You put there a DJ box, you put their parkour equipment and, and so on. They will end up trying out parkour and maybe becoming enthusiastic about it. We have to create the opportunity for them to, to be able to safely try it out. Okay. Um, I think we'll wrap it up for now. Um, thank you everybody for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, there'll be a short survey uh, sent to you uh, when you uh, sign off and I'll also forward you a, a link to the recording as well. So thanks for attending and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.
Thank you. Bye-bye.